is Whitney Walton. Whitney is a professor of history at Purdue University um, and the author of uh, uh, several works that I think, with which I think many of you will be familiar. Um, most recently, um, Internationalism, National Identities, and Study Abroad, France and the United States, 1890 to 1970. Um, and uh, before that, um, Eve's Proud Descendants, for Women Writers in Republican Politics in 19th Century France, and France at the Crystal Palace, Bourgeois Taste, and Artisan Manufacture in the 19th Century. Um, as uh, you perhaps not be surprised, Whitney will bring us into the 19th century um, with uh, a paper based on her current research about which you will learn in the paper. The title is A Frenchman on the Frontier, Science and Community in 19th Century New Harmony, Indiana. Thank you, Dina. But I am going to talk about other Francophone voyagers. In 1815, French naturalist and artist Charles Alexandre Lasseur needed a job. He had survived a productive um, and uh, dangerous expedition commissioned by First Consul Napoleon Bonaparte to explore Australia that lasted from 1800 to 1804. Many of the scientists, artists, and crew members had either died or left the ship, allowing the young artist and his equally young friend, Francois Perron, to assume leading roles in collecting and illustrating over 100,000 specimens of marine and land animals. After Perron's untimely death in 1810, Lesseur worked for the Museum of Natural History in Paris and shared a small apartment with his father. He was getting by, but Napoleon's downfall threatened the continuation of his small pension and his future was uncertain. When Scottish-American philanthropist and naturalist William McClure offered Lesseur an opportunity to pursue scientific research, all expenses paid for two years, Lesseur accepted. He wrote, I so wanted to visit distant seas to add more to our many observations. Crossing the ocean was an appealing lure. After fulfilling a two-year contract to draw, collect, and preserve specimens for McClure's revised geological survey of North America, Lesseur stayed in the United States until 1837. And there he is, uh, um, it, this is about 1818. This paper analyzes small portions of Lesseur's extensive visual and textual record of his time in the United States, especially the 11 years in New Harmony, Indiana, within the frameworks of cosmopolitan and national scientific practices, and including some attention to the history of migration and scientific illustration. As a career migrant to the United States, Lesseur was generally successful at pursuing his scientific interests, earning a living, and adapting to American habits. In Philadelphia and in New Harmony, he enjoyed cosmopolitan settings that included French persons and speakers, among them men of science. Yet he often felt frustrated with his limited capacity to publish his work and the lack of independent means or state support for long scientific expeditions. Lesseur never stopped scientific work, and his adaptations to circumstances related to migration include increased attention to community as publication and travel receded from his expectations. For almost 10 years in Philadelphia, Lesseur was a well-regarded scientist, and he worked hard to earn a living. Welcomed into the Academy of Natural Sciences, he served as curator and contributed to the publication of the Society's journal, in which he published several articles of his own. Lesseur constantly collected specimens, participated in a few expeditions, and did engraving and printing on request. He regularly obliged McClure, who for most of that time was in Spain trying to open a Pestalozzian school. Uh, and what Lesseur did for him was preparing and sending mineral collections and books to scientists in Europe and North America, and acting as a go-between to help another French recipient of McClure's largesse, Marie Duclos Fretageau, who established a Pestalozzian school in Philadelphia. He also taught art to private pupils at Fretageau's school. The school was satisfying but it did not relieve Lesseur of financial concerns, and he regretted that he lacked the resources for engaging in more field work. And he wrote, my work forces me to be sedentary. I am not able to go about the country as I wish. 
to linger on shore and observe the marine life, to add to my drawings and increase my collections. My means will not permit me. All that I have done thus far is due to the liberality of Mr. McClure. In 1825, in Philadelphia, as in 1815, in Paris, Le Sur was occupied, but not prosperous, and he hankered after voyaging to unknown places to collect and observe new species. The French government was not forthcoming with support for scientific expeditions that Le Sur contemplated, including voyaging up the U.S. eastern seaboard from Florida to Newfoundland, and Le Sur felt ignored by his scientific colleagues in France. He wrote to his friend Desmarais in France, I propose in future to publish scientific reports here. I will be reproached for this, I know, but it will be due to this type of indifference which prevails at home. Once again, McClure offered Le Sur the opportunity to practice science in the field, this time in an experimental community in Indiana. An additional attraction was the participation of fellow scientists, Thomas Say and Gerard Troost. Say, by the way, was of Huguenot origin. Uh, Gerard Troost, French compatriots and educators Marie Fretageau and William Ficpal, and three young persons in his care, Victor Dupalais, Virginia Dupalais, and Cecilia Noel. While Fretageau was a great enthusiast of Robert Owen's vision of equality and common property, and McClure initially thought New Harmony would be a good site to implement his progressive schools, the appeal for Le Sur was the opportunity to collect specimens in an area unknown to naturalists and in the company of friends and family members. In a letter to colleagues at the Paris Museum of Natural History, Le Sur wrote on August 4, 1826, of his move to New Harmony. I informed you of my departure for Indiana, a region that I had long desired to visit. The opportunity, though not very advantageous for me, but in accord with my taste for natural history, prompted me to abandon the existence that my work enabled me to have in Philadelphia in order to come and settle here for as long as I can find the means to employ my time usefully for science and to continue to send you the collections which this new field will offer me. The establishment in which I am working provides no salary, but one must pay by work to obtain the necessities of life. So, Le Sur produced a visual diary of the boat ride along the Ohio River from Pittsburgh to Mount Vernon, Indiana, from November 1825 through January 1826, recording the shoreline, small towns, other watercraft, geographical, um, uh, geographical formations, weather conditions, the colors and materials of the buildings, and activities of the passengers. So here is a town in Ohio, this is Steubenville, Ohio, that they pass, and here um, are the passengers eating dinner on the keelboat. Ice hampered the keelboat's progress, and he illustrated men's efforts to chop the ice and extricate the boat, while the men often gathered on the roof of the keelboat, this, I love this, to observe the passing shore, there's the men on the roof of the keelboat. Um, the um, Le Sur portrayed women and children occupying interior quarters. According to passenger Robert Dale Owen, the ladies were uncomfortable with the weather and conditions aboard, and he worried that they might scuttle the experiment. And I have to say, Le Sur's sketch of the passengers leaving Cincinnati does suggest some apprehension in their faces. Despite the hazards, the group safely arrived at their destination, and here uh, are some of his illustrations of New Harmony, uh, the church, uh, the granary down below, and his house on the left, which you will see again. Um, it's possible that Le Sur intended the drawings to be a personal as well as a community record, and he might also have contemplated future commercial publication since R.W.G. Vale notes that he later produced some plates for a proposed volume entitled Picturesque Views of the United States of America. Now, Le Sur's visual and textual account of a scientific expedition to lead mines in Missouri, starting in February 1826, right after he arrived, reveals the challenges of doing field work in the wilderness and the men's observations of and adaptations to local culture. Traveling overland as well as by boat along the Ohio and Mississippi rivers to reach Missouri, Le Sur, Gerard Troost, and a Dr. Cullock encountered settlers, slaves, and backwoodsmen. While tramping through poorly marked trails, they confronted two armed men, d'assez mauvaise mine, who asked if they had seen a man carrying a rifle. Le Sur writes that they held their ground, and now I'm going to quote him. 
We responded without the least trace of being afraid of them, that we had seen no one, but I made sure they saw the double barrel of my rifle. The exchange then became more friendly. The groups parted, and Lesur writes of camping out under a fallen tree in impenetrable, dar impenetrable darkness until he managed to light a fire. According to Lesur, he provided something of a tent for the men with his overcoat, which was their only protection when a tremendous storm started. He also plucked and put, cooked two small birds. That was their only food. The next day, in torrential rain and fog, the men tramped until they reached the Mississippi and finally encountered a ferry boatman who brought them by canoe, yeah, that's right, to his house near Commercetown, Missouri. Lesur and Troost continued from there to lead mines in the interior of Missouri with Lesur collecting plants and animals all along the way. He did comment negatively on slavery in Missouri, writing, generally all the places where we saw slaves had the appearance of impo impoverishment rather than uh, abundance. Now, in contrast to this informal record of the hazards of field work, he published an account in 1827 with Troost that detailed their scientific observations and the practical applications of them. The article emphasized the inefficiencies of mining practices at Lamotte and Burton and asserted that based on Lesur and Truce's analysis of mineral samples, the miners were discarding high content lead residues. The report also suggested that given an abundance of zinc in Missouri near the Mississippi, transporting copper downriver from Lake Superior could produce the valuable commodity of brass uh, and thus obviate the need for foreign imports. Lesur's personal, visual, and published accounts of the lead mine expedition suggest his successful adaptation to American science as it developed in the early 19th century and to American culture generally. He was no armchair theorist, as some in the United States denigrated European scientists for being. Rather, in keeping with American scientific practices of the time, Lesur sought the wilds of nature for observation, collection, and classification and he and Troost asserted the practical application of science to economic and industrial progress in the United States. Additionally, Lesur was adept at wilderness survival, <laughs> his double-barreled gun, though he also noted that American settlers usually traveled on horseback or in horse-drawn vehicles and were surprised to see travelers on foot. And I have to read this. He says, um, the inhabitants are not accustomed to seeing travelers on foot with backpacks. Thus, they looked at us with surprise. And when we passed through the village, everyone came to their doorways to watch us go by. Yet, Lesur had always been a practitioner of field work, including on the Baudin expedition to Australia. And his work represented part of a naturalist turn around 1800 from European science gen in Europe, within European science generally toward observation rather than systematizing. So I think Lesur bridged American and French scientific communities out of necessity and inclination. He would have been happy to join a French government expedition and generate more scientific knowledge and service to the French state. But his association with Napoleon through the Baudin expedition might have been an impediment to his advancement in the French scientific community under the Restoration. Or perhaps geographical distance prevented French colleagues from responding more favorably to the collections Lesur sent them, or to his efforts to publish in France and to win French support for scientific expeditions in North America. While American scientists uh, showed high regard for Lesur, and um, this is the kind of work that Lesur really wanted to be doing. Um, this is a lithography of a, of a fish. and th This is what he really wanted to publish. And he did publish this one. Um, uh, they admired his artistic ability and his work on North American fish. His inability to write in English required collaboration with other naturalists who could, contributing to Lesur's limited published output in the United States. So rather than align Lesur with either American or French national scientific trends, though he participated in both, it makes more sense to chart his pragmatic adaptation to the circumstances and opportunities available to him. In New Harmony, as in Philadelphia, Lesur increasingly regretted that he lacked the resources for scientific work, though he never abandoned scientific practice. He continued to teach art, collect specimens for the school in New Harmony, and to send to France, 
and to work in other capacities for the school and the community as a whole. He did surveying. He was the doctor. He taught science. He painted scenery for the local theater. Even after the end of the Owenite plan for collective social and economic organization. McClure departed New Harmony for the more agreeable climate in Mexico, and he entrusted Fredesha with running the school in New, in New Harmony. In her efforts to economize, she clashed with Lesur over his teaching responsibilities, his wages, and his housing expenses. And that's his house today in New Harmony. Um, <clears throat> she also believed that his scientific field work was a waste of time. Lesur also lost the scientific companionship of Troost when Troost left New Harmony to become professor of geology at the University of Nashville and of Thomas Say, who helped Fred Ajo administer the school and then succumb to tuberculosis in 1834. Lesur compensated somewhat for the loss of scientific comrades in New Harmony by frequent visits to New Orleans, where he collected his pension from France, sold products from New Harmony, and worked with amateur naturalist Joseph Barabino, who also died in 1834. Long after Lesur's death, a former pupil and youngest son of Robert Owen remembered the way that Lesur combined scientific practice with teaching, daily life, and community bonds. So writing in 1886, Richard Owen described Lesur as a very kind-hearted man and a magnificent artist who taught young Owen how to draw and modeled scientific observation and collection. And I'm going to read to you a quote. In summer, he was fond of swimming in the Wabash River, and I frequently accompanied him. He instructed me how to feel with my feet for unios and other shells as we waded, sometimes up to our neck in the river or ponds, searching to add to our collections. When he went fishing with others, he always exchanged his fine, common fishes for the smallest, and to them, the most indifferent looking when he recognized some new species or even variety. Just as Lesur continued practicing science wherever he went, and in spite of his limited resources, he also practiced his art. Um, and this is from the collection at Purdue University, which is very small, but is, it contains some of his work. And here, um, even though I want to engage with some of the scholarship on scientific illustration connected to empire, uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to um, mention um, a scholar who studied Lesur's scientific work from the Australian expedition. John West Subi um, uh, acknowledged that um, uh, he viewed Lesur's art as um, never changing. That is, Lesur's way of seeing never changed. Whatever the purpose of his art, Lesur looked at subjects with the same eyes, a kind of whimsical gaze, the expression of emotion and subjectivity, a tendency towards anthropomorphism. And I think that this analysis of, of uh, uh, Lesur's art applies to the, sh the small sample that I present here. Um, his North American drawings were a record of what he saw as a traveler and increasingly as a migrant with ties to persons and places rather than an imperial explorer capturing subjects on paper. And in particular, this small collection of drawings in Purdue University archives represent a community, people listening to music, a man in a top hat peeling potatoes, a woman sleeping, a man reading, women sewing. And I have to say, some of these were by his pupils, Virginia du Palais and um, Lucy uh, Sister Say, as well as by Le Sur himself. I think also that the watercolor of a family of field mice uh, might uh, have that anthropomorphic quality that Wes Subi noted. Lesur experienced plenty of frustrations and grievances during his time in New Harmony, but this was his home for 11 years, and he was very attached to the family of his niece, who had married General Twig, and with whom he shared the house, the same house. With the loss of his scientific comrades, the threatened loss of his French pension, his inability to secure ownership of his house from McClure, and perhaps renewed hope following the July Revolution of 1830, Lesur decided to return to France. However, outbreaks of cholera in New Orleans and Paris delayed his departure. During this time, 
He enjoyed the visit of amateur naturalist Prince Maximilian of Wied and the artist Carol Bodmer to New Harmony in 1832, 33, and 34. And this is Bodmer's painting of Le Sur in 1834. Weed acknowledged both Lesseur's scientific contributions and the limited dissemination of his work, writing, it would be a pity if the interesting labors of Mr. Lesseur in natural history were not communicated to the learned world during his lifetime. Lesseur left the United States in 1837, and although he missed his family in America and complained about the high cost of living in Paris after he returned to France, he also worked on his collections, learned more about lithography, and finally received some long-sought recognition for his scientific work in France when he was appointed to the position of director of the Museum of Natural History of Le Havre. This limited selection of his extensive work suggests that scientific practice was as pragmatic as it was national or cosmopolitan, that the naturalist artist's gaze was aesthetic, curious, empathetic, and personal, as well as imperial or colonial, and the community mattered to Lesseur in a way that Robert Owen and William McClure did not anticipate or appreciate when they embarked on their experiments in communal living and progressive education. Thank you.